The material in this episode of the Relentless Podcast may be triggering for some. Viewing and listening discretion is advised. Hi, I'm Corey Hirsch, and my definition of relentless is you just keep on going. You keep putting one foot in front of the other, no matter what happens, no matter what happens to you. You just keep moving forward. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Relentless Podcast. My name is Kyle Dubé. I'm very excited to be here with our guest today. We are very excited to have uh, Corey Hirsch, who is a former NHL Olympic goalie and a uh, and coach, a broadcaster, a public speaker, and now an author of a book called The Save of My Life, which is incredible. So, Corey, we are excited to have you here. Thanks for coming on the Relentless Podcast. Well, thanks for having me. I, I didn't realize that I, I do all those things. I, ja, what is that? Jack of all trades, master you, of none. That's you, that's me. You're, it's, an impress, <laughs> it's an impressive resume is Thank what you. it is. Yeah. Um, <laughs> You've done a lot of things in your life, which is very cool. Well, I've um, yeah, I've, I've been blessed. I, I played uh, junior hockey in Kamloops. I uh, played in the National Hockey League with the New York Rangers, Vancouver Canucks, Washington Capitals, Dallas Stars. I mean, how much time do we have? We could just keep We've going got a lot of time, on man. and on with teams. I mean, <laughs> really, I, it just it never ends. What um, do they? What do they? Uh, listen, I don't ever. I because. I don't ever want to take away from, but is that called a suitcase? Uh, pretty much, yeah. Pretty much, yeah, but, well, uh, there's uh, not but many, I don't want to make yeah. fun of it because no, I was, I was uh, captain of my house league team when I was 16 when you were playing in the WHL. Uh, well, you know what? There's nothing wrong with that. But you know what? It's um, In all honesty, there's very few that get to stay with one organization. Yeah. The elite, elite, of course, they get to, but everybody else, we're all bouncing around. It's a rarity, And right? it's, you're, you're going from one team to the next trying to find a, a spot, trying to find, and that's you know, that's probably most of the National Hockey League. You just don't realize it, right? Because the only players you key on are like the Connor McDavid's and the yeah. Dry Sidles. But the fourth liners, yeah, they're you know even the third liners. They, they you've got every year you're fighting for a job. You look on their hockey DB and you are surprised. Yeah. Oh, I forgot that they played on this team, or I forgot that they played on that team. So for you coming up as as a, as a goaltender, a young goalie uh, in the WHL. Um, getting drafted to the New York Rangers, you ended up um, carving out a pretty good professional hockey career for yourself. Do you want to talk a little bit about that before yeah. we get into some of the, the other stuff we're going to talk well, about? Well, I mean, they, uh, yeah, I, I was blessed to play on some pretty good teams. Like Kamloops, when we played junior hockey, was like playing for a little mini NHL team. Um, I mean, I played with Scott Niedemeyer, Daryl Sador, like guys that have won Stanley Cup. Scott Niedemeyer is probably one of the top five all, all time defenseman in the National Hockey League, and yeah. he was my junior hockey defenseman, right? Yeah. So, as a goalie, uh, you couldn't ask for a better place to play. But then, yeah, getting drafted and, and going to the Rangers. But playing for the New York Rangers, I always say, is like this it's like playing for the Yankees. Mm -hmm. You can play for the Devils or the Islanders or the, you know, even the Mets or the, or, or the Nets or whatever in basketball. But when you play for the Rangers or the Yankees, it is electric. And that city, it's it's the most incredible place in the world is Madison Square Garden. And I encourage people to go to a game there. You just have to go see it. Go to one game. And then, yeah, from there I bounced around a little bit, played in Vancouver. Um, you know, had some mental health challenges that uh, derailed me a little bit. But, um, you know, I look at my hockey careers as the platform to what I do today, which is try to help people with mental health and, and try to, you know, I, I wouldn't say that it, I, I don't like using the term end the stigma because, you know, I, I feel like, you know, we're all doing our part. I feel right now, let's just put a dent in it, right? right? Let's, let's get people help. Let's put a dent in the stigma. And then my generation, our generation, um, we're starting the talk on mental health. Yeah. It's our next kid's generation. They're the ones that are going to end the stigma. Yeah, I agree with that statement, actually. I, I, it's kind of like saying, let's end homelessness. Like It's just such a massive thing that I think we have to watch our language. But yeah. this is a great segue. Let's get into this then. Um, Absolutely. And realistically, this is why you're here today, which, I, which I'm so thankful for. Let's talk about... And this will go back to hockey because this all started happening uh, while you were playing hockey. Tell us about, if you're okay with this. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and actually, before we do that, I am going to say this. You, in 2017, wrote an article in The Athletic. It was Players' Tribune. Oh, sorry. The, yeah. sorry, the Players' Tribune. Um, totally my bad there. And I remember reading it at, at the day. I read it again about a week ago knowing you were coming on the show. 
And I think, what did you call it? Was it dark? He was about dark, eight darks. Dark, right. Yeah. <laughs> that was the title of it because it was dark. If, if you're lie. listening and you have not read this, I really encourage people to read this and, and for a couple of reasons. One, um, your vulnerability in this article you wrote was phenomenal to me uh, because in the world we live in, although I do think it's getting a bit better, but a dent is being made, quite often men, especially high-level athletes, uh, don't always show their vulnerability, and you did that in this. And two, your rawness and your openness about what you went through uh, is gut-wrenching and actually brought tears to my eyes both time I read it. Um, so I just want to tell people, look that up. Look that up yeah. because it's, it Thank truly you. is incredible, and I think it actually has probably helped way more people than you'll ever know. Um, I hope so. Thank I, you. I think it has. Yeah. Now, that if you read that, you're going to talk a little bit about that right now. Talk about the mental health stuff you were going through, kind of when it started, and some of the experiences you had with it, if you're okay with that. Yeah, I, I was probably always prone to um, anxiety issues. Um, but we, when, I was, when I was 21 years old, um, something I, just, I always describe it like something in my brain just broke. All right, it's depression can creep up on you, anxiety and all that stuff. OCD is a little bit different for me in the sense, but there's two sides of OCD. Some people say they've always had it. Some people could tell you the day that they felt things just changed. And I, I could tell you the day, time, where I was, what I was doing. Um, and the best way I describe OCD is like this. You know, when you're driving your car down the road, cars are coming one way, you're going the other way. It's a two lane road. Um, and you have that silly thought of what if I just drop, drove my car into the other lane? What if I just swerve? Of course, it's just the thought and you would never do that, but we have a million thoughts that pop up in our head every day. And, and, right. and they, you know, a thought is just the thought. Well, I, I would never hurt anybody. And it would be uh, that thought for me or for let's first go to somebody who doesn't have an ocd brain they would go home do their emails they would never think about it again they would just go on with their life and know that that's an ocd brain mine would get stuck on it i would ruminate about it because i would never ever want that to happen and my ocd would would it be a, a an epic battle in my head where my brain would be lying to me going, you know, what if that happened? People would be catastrophic. It would be all this. And you'd I'd ruminate on it, ruminate on it. And then just to have it prevent it from, well, how can we never have that happen? Well, I'll just stop driving my car, right? So it's repetitive, sticky thinking is kind of how they, they saw, you know, a record player when it's broken, right. how it skips. That's kind of what happens in your brain, except for there's no way to take the needle off the record player, right? It's in your brain. And it's all about avoiding something catastrophic happening and that's the best way i can describe it um i would never do that right of course but it's the what if but then everybody's it's just, like but then the it's what just if, trapped what in your if. brain it's right? just trapped and it won't and it just continues and with every thought like that it's like getting hit with a taser gun of anxiety it's like zap 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 to the point where you know your brain is just so overwhelmed and the, and it's you end up in in panic attacks and that's prior to getting help getting there is help for it right um and there is therapy for it so but can, can i just yeah, jump in because ocd to me the way you just described that is actually it's really good for me to because i i i, I heard you actually on another podcast talk about ocd and you talked a yeah. little bit about like the, the, the different levels and the different types of it essentially because when people think of ocd i don't think they think of it no, that way they don't i think they think of ocd um hand washers uh, organized right, right. They, overly clean that's right yeah. don't touch that doorknob or yeah. you have to do it seven times in a row or yeah. those types and there of are things. those yeah absolutely but what you're talking about is this repetitiveness of thinking you know you have this thought oh do i turn into traffic and yeah. like you said most people just go home oh, whatever it was thought but now you are just trapped in this to the point where it's starting to control your life absolutely my brain will take it to the extremes to the to the extremes um where you're exactly right it, it, it would con it would control my whole life but that's why the article i think hit so hard because i do everything in my head so you can't see it, right? Like you can't see the outward compulsions that people do. So that's how I was also able to hide it while I was playing, you know, in the National Hockey League. Um, so 
you know, for, for most people, they think of that because, but you can see it and you can see people that, and they're like, why well, I, I, my house is overly clean. I have a little bit. No, you don't have a little bit of OCD. Okay. Most of my friends that have been diagnosed with OCD have at some point in their lives made a suicide attempt. Right. right? Um, and you know, that's not saying that because you have OCD, that's the way it's going to go. But most have struggled you know, so badly before they found out and they were diagnosed that it, that it almost went that way. So, you know, it's very debilitating. It's one of the top 10 de- most debilitating illnesses in, in the world. Um, but there also is help and there also is hope. So it gets better. It's highly treatable. The problem is, is that people aren't educated on it and they don't know what's going on. They just know something's up in there and they just, keep trying to figure it out and then you know before you know it you're you've spiraled into a a hole so deep that you can't dig yourself out so we're going to talk about the help and the hope a little bit later because those are two excellent h words that i'm i'm excited for you to talk about but let's talk about when you were dealing with this for quite some time when did it all kind of uh come to a head for you where you thought okay i need to get my help in order so i can have some hope yeah. Well, it, it came to a head for me because I, I was down on my knees. I, I was in debilitating panic attacks again, and I was non-functional. I really, I really was. I was. And you were in the NHL. I was in the time. NHL. I lost thirty pounds. I was down to one hundred and forty-five pounds. I'm not a big guy as it is. Um, I was played at one seventy-five. Um, you know, my teammates could start to see it, skin and bones, right? Um, and it, I couldn't hide it any longer. Right. It was to the point where I had to go get help. But why I do what I do and why I go out and I try to educate, not just on OCD, but in mental health, because it doesn't have to get to that point. Right. right. And we need to educate our children and people on mental health. And I think as a society, we have failed people in educating them on mental health. So I go out and I say, look, here's what happened to me. Here's what this is. I'm not qualified to treat anybody. No, but I am qualified enough to tell people my story, which could educate someone into going and getting help right. because most people don't know. And, and we've done a disservice to our youth. And, and part of the reason I do what I do is, is I'll be honest, I, I'm, I'm pissed. I have a chip on my shoulder. Why was I not taught that stuff in high school? Why, why was that information on OCD, anxiety, depression, why was it withheld from me? It, it almost killed me, right? So why today still... I mean, this is what I was in high school uh, 35 years ago. Well, it's 20, you know, without dating this podcast, it's 2023 right now. And we still don't have that education in our schools. It's not, it's not, it makes no no sense to me. No, some, and some schools implement it. Some teachers implement it, but it's not mandatory. And there isn't, you know, and there's people out there trying to make it mandatory and they're trying to make it, uh, you know, but why are we still withholding? Like we could be saving youth lot like we could be saving lives yeah. right you know um and and then you and i are a year apart uh you're 72 i'm a 73 so like when uh, you know when we were coming up this was not talked about god and, no. and in the world you lived in uh high level elite athlete hockey from yeah. juniors to professional olympics you're a silver medalist in the olympics all that type of stuff there was an attitude of if you're injured, if you're hurt, whatever that is, and we're talking physical. We're not talking mental. We're talking yeah. physical. Suck it up. Let's go. Let's go. Yeah. Think of concussions, right? That. But like you said, you can't see the mental no. health in that. No. And I, it must have been almost impossible, pr- probably impossible for you to think, I can't even talk to anybody about this. Oh, God, no. Yeah. No, I was, I mean, this is the stigma was... Because heaven forbid you had a mental health issue, people thought you were you they couldn't rely on you or that you were going to crack under pressure and all this. And I always say this: I say this in my talks. I made the National Hockey League with, you know, a, a full extreme mental health issue. Right. Don't tell me I'm weak, right? Yeah. I made the I was on the NHL rookie team. Um, Michael Phelps, twenty three gold medals, suffers from depression, right? Like, like this notion that that people are going to crack because they have anxiety or depression or some form of mental health issue. It's garbage. It's garbage because the numbers are one in five. I think they're more like three in five of people that struggle with mental health issues. So if they're one, even if they're one in five, there's twenty. 
22 players, 20 players that play on a, every National Hockey League team. One team has to win the cup. Mm. Mental health doesn't discriminate. It doesn't care if you're a doctor, lawyer, sports athlete, whatever. That means that every championship team statistically that wins a Super Bowl, whatever, 20% of them have a mental health issue that they are dealing with at that time. So you're talking a hockey team, three or four guys won a Stanley Cup championship. Now, you know, does that mean there's – it's whatever, but statistically – and because mental health doesn't discriminate, there might be more people on that team yeah. that struggle with mental health yeah. issues. So don't tell me that people are weak that have yeah. mental health issues. It's the biggest joke, and it's the biggest cop out, you know, for for someone to you know to say or whatever. And it's it's time that ends. It's, Michael Landsberg, uh, yeah. former TSN, he's got the big thing. Sick, sick. I think it's sick love not Michael. weak. Yeah, yeah. sick and not weak. Yeah, man, that guy, eh? outspoken. I love yeah. it. I could listen to him, and he is just honest and raw. But that's the way I feel you are too, Corey. Well, why why go out and tell little snip? Like if you're gonna help people, help them, right? right? Like what what am I, I? What do I have to hide? Like I like I don't, I, you know. If I can help somebody, why not help them? Like, and if you're gonna tell your story, why why tell snippets or don't tell at all? Yeah. Right. Like if you're gonna go out to help people, go out and do it. And the only way we're gonna do that and how we how we learn is we educate ourselves through each other, you know, through each other's stories. Um, you know, and, and we all have a story. Like I'm just a guy with a platform. I'm no different than you or anybody else, right? And my, my job was televised. Yeah, I was good at it, but it was televised. There's doctors out there that are incredible, but we don't know who they are because their jobs aren't televised, right? No one's paying to watch, you know, watch that. Right. But I have a platform that I can use to be able to tell my story and to be able to help people. And if I don't use it for what I've gone through, then shame on me, right? My purpose and my mission, I believe, is to help other people. And there's healing in helping other people. So I'm sitting here talking, and as, as we talk, I get to heal a little bit too, right? It helps me too. So, um, Do you, yeah. you know, when we think of the word relentless, because that's what this podcast is, yeah. that's, that's what we, we talk a lot about. Um, there's some things in my life that I would say, like, are the most relentless things that that the most relentless pressure to me mental health is a very it's a relentless pressure it is relentless it doesn't stop right yeah. it doesn't stop no it, and it it doesn't but there's treatments available there's medications available there's help that's available the the issue with with what happens is is that it's like anything else if you get diagnosed with cancer or diabetes or whatever early on well you've got a better chance at you know recovery and a better chance at, at healing and all that stuff but because we don't teach people at mental health, like it's the same. If you get diagnosed early on, right? Well, you've got a way better chance of, of recovering much quicker and getting control of it. Instead, like for me, I dug a hole for three years, right? Well, what do you think? By then I had to dig myself out of it. I had a way longer way to go after three years than someone that gets diagnosed and gets help. And I'll, I'll, t I'll say this. I have a child that has an OCD as well. And because we talked about mental health in our homes, um, you know, I said, if anything funky comes and goes or whatever, you know, tell me, let me know. Well, so sure enough, when she was, you know, older, um, she comes to me and goes, dad, I'm having some funky thoughts. Right. And, uh, okay, let's go. So we took her to a uh, psychologist. She got diagnosed with OCD as well, but she won't get to that place that I got to because right, because early diagnosis and early help. And if it wasn't for me having that happen to me, I, we wouldn't have been able to help her. And most families don't know because we're not educated and they don't know what to do. Right. And, and, and it's, and it's difficult and we need to educate people and we need to educate families and have them, you know, so that they can, they can help, help our children, help other people. That's what we're here for. Conversations are key. And uh, the openness of, our generation as parents and older generation and the generations coming up to be able to have those conversations with their yeah. kids is so important. Um, for you, you were how old when you decided, uh, okay, I'm going to go and get some help here. And what did that look like for you? Cause now let's talk yeah. about the help. Right? 24, 25, 24, yeah. 25. So, so you're, you're, started you're when I was 21. Fairly, yeah. I'm not going to say super deep into your career, but you're deep into your career. I'm just trying to hang on every day. Right. right. But I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, but I'm what does three, that look like for in. you, Corey? Trying to hang on every day. You're showing up to the it's rink. Awful. The, so, what it was is, awful. Yeah. It was awful. Yeah. I mean, cause your teammates said so, no, right? No, but they're, cause you're not going to tell anybody, but there's so many signs, right? I withdrew, like, you know, when I was doing well, I'm, 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 you know, I'm, I'm with my friends, I'm doing, I'm hanging out. So I started to withdraw from everybody. Well, there's sign number one. 
uh, you know, uh, first guy, you know, on the ice, last guy off, usually hard worker. Well, you know what? I went from that to being the last guy on the ice to the first guy off because I didn't want to spend any time in front of my teammates. Sign number two, late for meetings, late for practices, late for disheveled when I got to the rink, you know, um, disoriented, just trying to get on the ice and get myself on the ice, right? There's another sign, right? Sure. Uh, thankfully, at that time, I didn't have substance abuse issues. But it could have been very possible, could have been very easy for me to fall on that. There's another sign, right? Like, like all the signs were there, but because none of us were educated on it and anybody didn't know, honestly, I look like a shitty teammate. I look like a bad teammate. Which you were not I was just trying teammate. to survive. I was right. just trying to survive every day, right? Um, the best I knew how. The Relentless Podcast is brought to you by You Can Youth Services, which I am very proud to be a part of. You Can Youth Services is an organization that helps young people move out of harm's way and onto a path of economic independence. If you want to learn more about the incredible work that we do with some very vulnerable young people, please go to www.youcan.ca. That's www.youcan.ca. Who did you talk to first? Uh, Mike Bernstein, trainer of the Vancouver Canucks. I pulled him aside. Um, well, first of all, I talked to my mom. Yeah. But um, and She they, must have been so concerned. She had no idea. She had no idea, right? But I mean, at that time, she was probably so concerned. Oh, yeah, but she had, didn't know what to do, right? right? She had no idea what to Lack do. Lack of education. Because, yeah, she had, I mean, she was born in the late 40s, early 50s, yeah. right? Like, there's nothing. You dropped off Uncle Joe at the asylum, and if you saw him again, great. And if you, you know, and he was a completely different person if you did, and but you might not, right? It was just, it was so barbaric and so... Um, inhumane right. how they used to treat people and and heaven forbid like my mom she was terrified to tell anybody because right the stigma, stigma and i wouldn't be allowed in people's houses and stuff right like somebody was going to catch it you know like, yeah and my yeah. mom didn't know what to do nobody knew what to do and that and that's we and still today you know it's hard for parents and and i and i feel for parents because they want to help their kids they don't know where to go they don't know mm -hmm. what to do and we need to educate them on that you know, um, what was the trainer's response when you talked to him? Uh, well, I mean, there was a couple of things. I mean, probably knew I was struggling at that point. When I pulled him aside, I, I, I told him I was struggling. And he's like, okay, you know, blah, blah, blah. But then I told him I was suicidal. Yeah. And that was like, that's when he perked up. Yeah. Right. And he was incredible. The man <clears throat> saved my life. And I will say that to this day. Um, he just said, okay, just chill out. Uh, I'll, I'll figure this out. You just got to go. Kirk McLean was hurt at the time. And, and uh, when I did, and this was in New York, I had to play that night and I was like on my knees and I had to figure out how to get in the net. And, and by that point I was, you know, I was done. I, that night I played, it was terrible. Um, you know, the next, oh, I don't even know yeah. how you could have played. And the next day it just all came collapsing down in New Jersey. Um, and it was, uh, but I, I, and I say this, it was also the same day I saved my own life right. was I reached out for help. But at that point, because of, of the time and the stigma, I threw my NHL career away, but that's okay because it led me to what I do today and I'm alive, right? Well, I was because say, I got help. The, the, the throwing the NHL career away is different than throwing literally yeah. your life away. Um, well, and there's other factors too, right? Goalies got bigger and, and, you know, there was, there was those things, but still, I mean, yeah, it was after that back then. Um, and I still didn't tell anybody even after diagnosis. Right. So I'm still fighting, trying to, um, you do damage control behind me after that and not telling anybody it took me, well, okay, well, let's, let's, let's call it what it is. It took me 10 years to find the proper help. Okay. Um, after the initial, after telling. the initial diagnosis, yeah. right. Which is way too long, but I went to seven or eight therapists and I tell people this, it's like, just cause you went, some people go one or two and it's like, ah, there's no help. You know, I can't, no, you gotta go. You gotta keep, you gotta go. You six, have to be seven. relentless. You have to be relentless. Right. And that's beautiful. Thank you for saying that. So 10 years, I finally found someone that can help me. It was another 10 years, 20 years from diagnosis to my article coming out in the player's tribune. So if anybody thinks that I got sick, went to the doctor, got help now it's 20 years before i told anybody right um and here's the thing that's what it should be got sick went to the doctor the next day did the treatment went on with my life but because we shame people into hiding and the stigma and all that it takes people way too long to go get help and it you know by then like i said you've dug a hole so deep it's hard to get out of And what's tough in that situation is is we all need through mental health uh, 
support. We yeah. need friends. We need family. Uh, yeah. Like you said earlier, the more we talk about it, it can be healing, but it's also educational for people. Absolutely. I'll tell you that that this past summer, um, I, 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 I would say that I've dealt with some mental health issues in, in my life. Um, I don't think extreme, um, but but a little bit here and there. But this summer, ended up having uh, what are, have now been identified as uh, anxiety attack, panic attacks mm-hmm. that I had never had in my life before. Yeah. And the tough part about that situation is that some of the, the folks that were around me, and this is not a slam on them. These are like my best friends. Yeah. Um, and we were actually out of the country. We were in Ireland. Yeah. They didn't know what to do. Yeah. And I didn't know what to do. Yeah. And, they, and it became really tough really hard um i'm fortunate enough i've done a lot of counseling in my life Mm -hmm. um so i was fortunate that as soon as i got home boom right to the counselor we and we've been working through it ever since yeah um but again even with that support there's still a lack of education now the more that i've talked to these folks about it we're all understanding of what happened to me we're understanding a bit more they're even probably starting to see it in themselves a bit which is really good it's awesome right yeah but if we're not talking about it, we educate each other. That's right. how that's how we do it. Um, and your buddies, yeah, they probably didn't know what to do. Of course, they didn't because they'd never been educated on. Probably never seen anything right. like that before. Right? They hadn't experienced it yeah. themselves. Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, and, and that's how we're going to help people. We're going to we're going to educate. Um, we're going to educate each other by talking. And and if you are out there and you're listening and you and you're like, well, how do I get someone to talk? Well, sometimes you sharing your own story and sharing your own vulnerability. Um, I hate that word vulnerability by the way it's like you know i don't it's just it's overused and it's, it's like, a buzzword right i'm now. not vulnerable i'm showing strength by sharing my story you know I, you know what i don't mind the word vulnerable yeah i, I just i watch too much of the bachelor because of my daughter <laughs> bachelorette and it's see, like see, every second me, word is to me, I don't journey mi- and vulnerable yeah i don't mind the word vulnerable because i think i hear what you're saying though because it's used a lot it is yeah. a buzzword right now but I, I don't mind it just because I think that, especially with men, you know, we're just kind of yeah. taught to be tough and we're taught to act a certain way. Well, you know what is tough? Sharing your story. 100%. Right? Like I look at it. I've always looked yeah. at it that way. Yeah. Where if if you can actually share your story, if you can be vulnerable. Yeah. Actually, you know what I like better? Authentic. Yeah. If you can That's, be authentic yeah. and if you can. But authenticity is hard. Yeah. You know, because again, I think the way that, especially in our generation, the way we're raised, but you are then making yourself vulnerable to yeah. potential judgment or attack or this or that. And I'm at this stage in my life where I just don't give a shit. Exactly. If you don't care, if you don't like me, then you don't that's like me. Fake. But I still want to share some of this stuff. Yeah. Right. No. And, and that's exactly it. And you just hit it right in the head. If you don't like me, you don't like me. Right. I mean, that's, and that's what it is. And, and, and what you'll find out is that we're always so worried about everybody else. They're thinking about themselves. They're not even thinking about you. Right. right. Like we're worried about what someone <laughs> thinks of me. And it's like, they're, they're not even thinking of you. Yeah. And it's like, no, it's. They probably uh, don't even care that much. No, like, that's they the don't. Thing. And it's like, I, I don't. And, and once, once I share my story, it was like, the chains came off because mm. you, you get out of that hiding. So, so let's talk about that, that a little yeah. bit. This was in tw- 2017 yeah. when you wrote this article. Um, well, I'd, help, I'd help write. I don't write at that level. So <laughs> you, you, it's kind of a ghostwriter. It's, it's, Dude, take it's the in credit. your, no, good take Lord, I cannot because he is such an incredible writer. He wrote my book and I, well, he edited my book and added the, and it's just, it's all. Well, how about this? Now. It's your story. Yeah. It's your rawness that he yeah. put into words, yeah. and, right? Yeah. He didn't make this shit up. Like, no. You, you no. told him. Oh, I was there. It's, it. it's very real. I was there. It, I'm telling you, <laughs> it is. I really encourage people. And I haven't read your book yet, um, but I'm going to. I actually just bought it on Audible. Okay. Do you read it in the? the... Uh, I wrote. So what happens is I had a writer. No, 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 I know, oh, okay. I know they wrote, I but like yeah. on Audible, is it your voice? No, it's somebody oh, else's, yeah, so which is, I, I wanted to, but they said no, <laughs> you know, and I think they funkied up some of the names, so I, I don't know what okay. happened there, but well, it's still, I'm, I'm the book is still it. the book. So. But that article to me, I'm telling people, like, buy the book, because I'm sure it's amazing, if, the book is probably just an extended version of that article, like yeah. an expanded, and... I just encourage people to read it so much. I'm going to ask you to try to read the book. You know why? Because we wrote it in so that it's 
for people like you and I that don't typically like to read, yeah. you won't be able to put it down. Yeah. And it's the it's got good size uh, font. font. It's got a lot good of spacing. <laughs> there's pictures. Good. There's coloring. <laughs> <laughs> no, but Who have you've been talking to that knows I've, that's I what Dubai needs. I he encourage, needs, yeah. yeah, I encourage because the, I wanted it that way because uh, I know what I'm like in reading because my brain's all over the place. Yeah. So it's a book for people that when they read it, you can read it and you can read it one day. I love it. Yeah. So it's, um, well, I'm going to, and, I'm no, 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 get Ken, you. and if not, take the audible book. And if not, I'll just call me. I'll tell you the story. The reason I do the audible stuff is because I like to, to, it's like a podcast. I like to do what yeah, I drive. Yeah, right. Yeah. But no, for sure. I'm, uh, we're going to do this. Now, listen, when you, when you came out with your mental health in 2017, what was that like for you? Because you are a public figure. Um, did you end up getting a lot of support? Did you end up, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm sure the hockey world was like, shock. this is amazing. Was it shock? Shock. shock for a lot of the people, my friends, guys that I played with because they played with me and they had no idea. And they almost felt bad that they had no idea, but it wasn't their fault. Like there mm-hmm. wasn't anything they did. I was hiding. I wasn't telling anybody. Mm-hmm. Right. And they were there like the guys that were in the locker room, you know, they were the ones that were like, geez, uh, 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 we knew you were going through something, but I didn't know it was anything like this. So and little, it's not a their little, fault, uh, though. mini documentary type yeah. thing that they did, and Trevor Linden was on there talking, yeah. and he talked a lot about that. Yeah, and that's, right? I didn't tell anybody, and that's on me, right? And that's, so now what I do is I tell people, hey, I'm not having a great day. Because what happens is when you are with somebody and you're ha- not having a good day, they think it's them, that's right. something that they did. So I communicate, hey, this is the benefit of having those chains off is I just look at, uh, I had this with my daughter the other day. I said, look, you know, I'm, I'm not having a great day. If please don't think it's you, right? I love hanging out with you. I love being with you. I'm just not having a good day. That takes the pressure off of her, right? Having to feel sure. like, what did I do to my dad? Why is he like this? Is he, you know? And then so communication is very important. It takes the pressure off, but it also yeah. lets that person know that they are, um, maybe then they can support what does that look like? It takes them exactly. It takes them out of feeling like they're the problem to feeling right. like they can help and support. Right. right. Now let's talk about that. Let's talk about the help part. So you went, and I love how, how honest you're being about it took that many years to actually get that help, yeah. but you were relentless in it. You were relentless in the pursuit of it because the mental health was still being relentless on you. Yeah. I, I remember uh, when I was 25 years old, 26 years old, really one of my first counseling sessions, a psychologist, really cool dude. And he said to me, he goes, listen, it's taken you about 25 years to get to this point. And if you think this is going to get fixed in the next five sessions, it's not, it's probably going to take yeah. you 25 years. Maybe. To get, right? yeah. Like he said, it takes time and it's a process it's and it's a, exactly right. That's what it so is. So I've, I've had two shoulder surgeries and, and I've, I, I just, like a moron hurt my knee skiing because I thought I was faster and younger than I was. But uh, that was 25 years ago that I hurt my shoulder. Well, I still have to do maintenance on it, right? I still got to, I still got to lift. I still got to do stuff that little things, bands and all that, right. To keep it from, and it's no different with with your brain. I mean, it's, it's all every day. You got to do the work, right? You got to do, it's just what it is, but it gets better. Like, you, you know, maybe at the start it's, it's too much, Right. And it's like too much to handle and intense, but eventually, you know, you do the little things and you do the little things every day and, and you, you, it's, you know, it's, you're, you're actually better and stronger than you were before. Right. Right. And people, that's, that's just what it is. But yeah. And, and I encourage people, like I said, just to go get the help as early as you can, because the longer you let it go, like anything else, it's, you know, it's tougher to fix. fix. So Talk to us a little bit then about what that type of help can look like. Now, obviously, I appreciate what you said earlier. I'm not, uh, like you, I'm not in any way qualified to be a counselor, to be anything like no, that. No, yeah, me neither. But I can definitely share resources with people. Mm-hmm. Um, every single person is different. We're all wired up different. We're all this and that. For you, it took about seven or eight counselors or psychologists yeah. or, or whatever it was. Um, I'm a big believer that you just got to go until you find a fit. 
Yeah, and that, that and might, it be might it take too. yeah one or two, but it might take seven or eight. I've gone to psychiatrists, psychologists, counselors where I'm like after a meeting going, nope, yeah. I do not connect with that dude. No click. And that's okay. Then I'll go find somebody else. And they're right? not offended and, by and it. No, 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 no. And I've connected with some amazing, amazing people, right? Yeah. Um, so you just got to keep searching till you find somebody you connect with and that can help you. And if, I mean, and I also say this, people are like, okay, so I talked to a person yesterday and- uh, they were diagnosed with um, with something and they weren't getting better after about six months. And I was like, well, you need to go find somebody because obviously you're not getting the proper help or you haven't been properly diagnosed. And um, that's the thing. You know, you, if if after four months or five months or what, you're not getting better, well, you need to go find somebody else, right? Because something isn't isn't clicking because everything is there's always a path there's always a path ahead but people like you know after two months or whatever they're not getting better so they just quit right no 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 you're what you have is treatable you just maybe it's not the right person maybe it's not the right fit maybe you've been misdiagnosed go maybe it's the wrong medication maybe it's the wrong medication right right because the thing is the mental health isn't going to quit no so if you quit no. trying to do the treatments or getting yeah. the help, this beast yeah. of mental health is not quitting. No, it, it's not going to quit. But, you know, if you break your leg, it's not going to go away without help. You know, your leg's still going to be broken two years from then if you don't get the proper right. proper help. So we need to know that physical and mental health are the same things. They're yeah. just, we've somehow separated them. You get an injury, you go to the doctor. You do the therapy and treatment, you get better, you go on with your sure. life. Mental health, something goes on, you go see the doctor, you get the therapy, you go on with your life, right? The, I mean, the it's sad like, part to me, it's what it should and, be. And, and I hope we talked about generations, we hope our kids, our grandkids, whatever, is, are going to live in a world um, where you can go and have access to a counselor, a psychologist, a psychiatrist, um, the same way we do a medical doctor in Canada. Yeah. We can go and get free Man. help because I actually think there's a lot of people that struggle getting help because well, of the accessibility, because yeah. of the cost, and also because of the weights. We need know? to, yeah, we need to have more grants and more scholarships and more encouragement for our youth to go into psychiatry, psychology. Yeah. We need more money going into research. Yes. Um, but it's been. I mean, we're just now starting to realize that. So now we're scratching the surface. Yeah. And it's, yeah. it's like, at least we're recognizing it, but we are in a major crisis right now of, of mental health. And, um, you know, like I said, um, we need to encourage our youth to go into those practices and go into helping people because it's very rewarding, but you know, we just don't have enough. We don't. And I, I got psychiatrists, psychologists, friends. They want to help everybody and they got to turn people away because they they're so busy. And can you imagine going and and every at least once a day for a week, you're a therapist or you're a psychologist, a psychiatrist or a doctor, and someone's telling you they want to take their own life. Right. Well, you need time for you to decompress right. too as a, as, a, as a doctor, right? Yeah. Like you need that time too. So it's, it's kind of like we it's not their fault in that sense they're trying to help as many people as they can but we i'm currently on a waiting list for with yeah, I, I know of, i know of a guy who is um i've heard from two or three different people that is unreal and unfortunately i've been on his waiting list for four months and yeah. probably not yeah. coming anytime soon no and, right? and that's unfortunate that it's and it shouldn't be like that but it's not you can't get PO'd at the guy that's, you know, that's oh, trying to help people. All. No, it's um, the, he's, he's doing probably not at all the other can. people that are in there, but yeah. ahead of me with their mental health <laughs> yeah. issues. God get the frick out of my way. <laughs> right? And encourage, we need to demand better our system to be better. Well, that's the thing is it's a system. Yeah. Right? It's the system. Yeah. Um, you have a podcast, and yeah. I've listened to a few episodes now. Yeah. Um, it's called Blindsided. Yes. And you do it with a psychiatrist yes. named Dr. Diane, Dr. Dr. Diane McIntosh. Thank you. Yep. It's a really good podcast. Thank you. Yeah. Because you're on a very mediocre podcast right now, my friend. <laughs> so this, to me, is such a good podcast. And I've listened to a few of them. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just continue catching up and listening to them. I love your insights the same way you're talking right now. I love your insights on this and your lived experience, your willingness to share it. Yeah. And I love Dr. Diane's insights mm -hmm. 
Um, she just sounds like a cool lady. She's awesome. She's and the best. And the, the, the one episode that I listened to was with Paul – that really stuck out was with uh, Paul Bissonette, Big yep. Nasty. Um, famous for many things, but I would say mostly in the last three, four, five years, Spit and Chicklets podcast. And he was pretty raw and pretty real about it, but it was a yeah. really incredible conversation that you guys had. He um, – you see, and I know Paul in a different – form than the spit and chicklets and right. the guy out there and like paul is if i said paul if i said busy I'm, I'm moving next week i need some help he'd send two guys with a truck right or he'd show up himself yeah. right that's the type of guy he is and it doesn't matter that it's Corey hirsch or if it was my neighbor that's right. what that's what he's like and he had a tragedy when he was younger he had a friend take his his own life um but people don't know that stuff right like they just they want to judge and they want to and they want it and and it's like this guy is one of the kindest people and, and none of us are squeaky clean. No. Right. But no. his story is, is incredible. And, and he shared it and, and thank, and you know, and it's, and we've had, um, we've had Darius miles, we've had Bubba Watson, we've had Kevin love. We've so had the Bubba Kurt Watson. Warner, one I listened yeah. to and I was, I, I had no idea. No. About yeah. Bubba Watson yeah. going through his anxiety. Yeah. Going through what he no. went through. Right. So, um, yeah, and it's it's been it's very powerful. It's been an incredible experience. We were nominated for a Webby last year. Yeah. Lost to Kobe because nobody beats Kobe Bryant. No, right? No, anything about Kobe. Yeah. So I don't feel so bad about losing. Yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> I just think it's a, it's a it's a it's a great podcast. And and the thing is, it is about uh, uh, athletics and sports, but it's actually about way more than that. And, yeah, it's life. And everybody can definitely take. Um, it, it, all those things that athletes go through are the same as in real life. I and, mean, yeah. because because for you, you had hockey, yeah. But there's that's that's a small percentage of your life. Yeah, Every, that's life is life, and yeah. it's, it, there's other hard things. You know, one of the things that you guys and Paul talked about as well, which I really liked. Um. And we don't need to get into this big time on this podcast. It was just about these young players. You talked about it too. Young players going, leaving home at 15, 16 years old and billeting. And how I think it was Diane that said something along the lines of people think that that builds resiliency in these young people. Yeah. But it's actually it no. doesn't. No. Right? It's super hard. It's super tough. It's, yeah. it's It can actually lead to anxiety mm. for these young people. And, yeah. you know, I, I, I just think that the 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 underdeveloped brain of a 15 16 17 yeah. 18 19 20 year old person um can affect all this Corey, you um what are you doing now you literally just i believe this last yeah. summer announced that you're done with the broadcasting stuff for now yeah. uh what are you doing i'm speaking full time on mental health to anybody that'll listen organizations youth schools um, you know, I've, uh, right now I've, I've spoken to probably 30 to 40 construction pipeline, uh, workers, that middle-aged man trying to get people to get help and, yeah. and, and, and knowing that, you know, being a man nowhere in the dictionary, does it say must suffer in silence, right? Yeah. I don't, I don't see that anywhere in the dictionary, does it? But for whatever reason, that's what we think it means and encouraging people to go get help. So I'm out there talking to, you know, whoever will listen. Right, um, I'm very encouraged. Yeah. I'm very encouraged by that because here's the thing: uh, high schools, uh, sports teams, uh, youth sports teams, uh, that type of stuff. I, I, I think that schools can be very open to that. Now, my take on that though is it's great you have people coming in and talking, but now what? Yeah, are you going to actually do something? Not you. I'm talking about the yeah. school. Are they going to actually now do something with this? But what I love to hear is that these construction companies yeah. or these these corporations are starting to go, we have to start looking at this way, way more closely. We have to educate ourselves as leaders and then hopefully educate yeah. our people to be able to support them. Absolutely. I mean, I, I've spoken, I just spoke today with the Trans Mountain Group, uh, with the Pipeline. I spoke with Sereris. I've spoken with, um, you know, major construction companies. I've spoken with Cisco. I've spoken, right? Like major, major companies and corporations that want to help their employees. And, you know, it's it's not about the work or anything like that. It's about a human being and right. encouraging human beings. And if we can help one person, then you know I think I spoke to eight eight hundred to a thousand people just this morning um, with with Trans Mountain. And if you can help one person in that room and save one life, well, it was definitely worth it. Hundred percent, 
hundred percent. I think what we're gonna do, yeah, because you are tight for time. We are gonna we're gonna end. Well, we could talk for hours. We're gonna end part one. I'll be back. <laughs> You're gonna be back. You and I talked uh, earlier this week, a little pre-interview interview, and we talked about a lot of things. And um, what I would like it, and I don't know if you can make this. I would love it if you and Diane. Maybe, maybe. now I, we, yeah. we won't be able to do it in studio. That's too tough. But maybe if we did a Zoom one with you, be soon. awesome. Yeah. Um. And and what I would like to get into with you guys is even talking a little bit about that that youth brain and talking really specifically to young people. As you know, I'm the executive yeah. director of You Can Youth Services. We serve vul- I'm going to say the word vulnerable nah. young people, um, at risk youth. Um, we see young people daily that are dealing with mental yeah. health. And um, I'm very proud to say that our organization has um, in-house counseling for these young people to deal with their trauma. Yeah, And we've worked very hard to get the funding to make that happen so it's free for them. Yeah, Any young person that walks through our door will have access fairly quickly to certified counselors, psychologists. Like it's, it's great. Not every place gets to do that. Um, but I'd love to have you guys on to, to maybe talk a bit about that stuff. I appreciate your authenticity. Thank you. And I appreciate the fact that you want to talk to anybody yeah. about mental health, that you want to get this message out there. Um, we are going to end in a second uh, with what we call the relentless quiz. It's a scientific quiz we've put together to see if people are relentless. So we're going to do that in a second. It's kind of a fun thing. We're going to end every show that way now. Awesome. But, Let's talk hope before we totally end. What's your message of hope for people? Well, Dr. Diane McIntosh tells me this, and and there's days where I struggle where I have to call her uh, because it's, you know, what I have. And you know what she says to me? Corey, there's always a path ahead. And that's what I think hope is, is that knowing and believing that there's a path ahead, that, you know, life gets better if you get the help. I'm living proof that it gets better, right? And there's always a path ahead. I appreciate you, brother. Let's do a quiz. You ready? Let's do it. I didn't tell you any of these questions. All right. And they're very, they're they're kind of short. Yeah. We might discuss some of them. We might not. Corey, we're not sure how this is going to go. All right. But this will determine whether or not you are relentless. Okay. Okay. Corey Hirsch. Fruits or vegetables? Oh, definitely fruits. Yes, oranges, okay. apples, anything sweet. Okay, okay. City or countryside? I used to be city, now I'm country. I like having an outdoor fire. I like having no noise, and I like just having peace around me. Where do you, do you, do you come from countryside, or do you come from no, city? No, from Calgary, I'm from oh, city, okay. yeah, city, go. city, city. But, you, you know, when I've had opportunities at countryside, I've loved it now. Yeah. Dirty bathroom? Or dirty kitchen? <laughs> dirty kitchen. Gross in the bathroom. I won't touch anything. <laughs> Salty or sweet? Nah, I'm a sweet. I'm sweets. I, I got a sweet tooth, sugar. So you're like eating anything. a chocolate bar or oh, a bag of Lord. chips every day? Yeah, I am eating the chocolate. Yeah, you put a chocolate bar and O'Henry in front of me. I'm taking that over a bag of all dressed. Even. Oh. <laughs> yeah. oh, controversial, but I like it. Morning or night? Oh, I'm a morning person. Used to be night. Now I caught him up at like four or five every morning now. Four or five? Yeah, well, I go to bed at like 8.30. Okay. okay. <laughs> so what do you do at four or five? Like you working out? Or you yeah, I get up. Ready? I'll do some meditation. I'll work out. Yeah. I'll have a coffee sometimes. I, I don't know. Depends on the day. Go yeah. for a walk. Go for a run. Yeah. Nobody else I is I actually up. admire that. I think yeah. that's cool. Favorite? comedy movie oh of all time oh goodness yeah there's some good ones out there probably uh i would have to say old school anything will ferrell is probably you know what no tommy boy um (laughs) chris farley and david spade that is my favorite of all time unbelievable movie big party or small gathering a little small gathering yeah i want i want to be i want to be able to talk to everybody hang out Phone in the bathroom or no phone in the bathroom? Uh, 
oh boy it's uh, you know what remember when you were a kid and there was no phones and you'd have to and there was a, always graffiti in the bathroom stall and you'd read that <laughs> well you had that at your house <laughs> yeah well, sometimes yeah you got to keep busy right uh probably a phone phone's phone? fine in the bathroom yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. you learn a lot you got time just a, just a few more of these favorite love song of all time um oh god that's Funny, my endless love. <laughs> okay. Happy Gilmore. Okay. That's right. Another funny movie. Yeah. Second last question. Very important. Cake or pie? Oh, cake. Sweet, right? Definitely cake. Okay. Definitely cake. Yep. Chocolate or vanilla? I Chocolate. Even, I'm, oh, no, that's bad. Just don't even. Oh, yeah, answer. Too late. Yeah. yeah, I know, and I should have done that. This the because this, this oh, is scientific. Good. Last question. Yep. Describe your relentless podcast experience in four words. The fact that we're still sitting here after an hour and we're continuing to talk and we could talk for another four hours about mental health and trying to help people. You and I are both relentless doing that, my friend. Okay, but that, that was more than four words, man. <laughs> oh, four words. <laughs> four words. Is this podcast? Um is pain in the ass, four words? Pain in the ass. It is. <laughs> Corey nah, Hirsch. Love you, my friend. Listen, I love you too, well, brother. Hold up. Four. Love you, my friend. Love you, my friend. There you go. Ditto. Where can we find you on the socials? Uh, Instagram, Corey Hirsch 72. Twitter, Corey Hirsch. Uh, Facebook official. I'm on all those good things. LinkedIn, just Look under you my up. name. Look me Look up. Look you up. Google Send you. Send me a DM. Google me. Yeah. Yep. All good. Such a pleasure having you here. We're going to have you back. Uh, talk Absolutely. some more. Uh, thank you so much. And um, if you want to find UCAN Youth Services, you can find us on all the socials at UCAN Edmonton. And um, appreciate you being here. Yeah, thank you. And, and my book, Saving My Life. That's um, right. Go look for that. You can get that on Amazon Podcast, Blindsided Players Tribune. That uh, you can get anywhere you get your podcasts. I'm just trying to change your website. plugs as many your as website. I can. Your website is right a now. great website. CoreyHirsch.com. Yeah. CoreyHirsch.com. Helped out by Road 55. Awesome. awesome. All right. Thanks, Thanks brother. brother. Okay. Ciao. Thanks for joining us today on the Relentless Podcast. Today's subject can be quite sensitive to many people. If you are struggling in any way with mental health, we ask that you go to any of the websites that you see behind me right now or that are in the description of the podcast. If you need help, we really, really want you to go and get it.